to leave the gallery quietly, please. Uh, the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 8003 in the name of Annie Wells on raising awareness of diabolimia. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and would uh, those members who wish to take part in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Annie Wells to open the debate. Ms Wells, seven minutes or thereabouts please. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer and thank you to everyone who is speaking in this debate today. The reason for today's debate is to raise much needed public awareness of diabolemia, an eating disorder which, although estimated to affect around 40% of young women aged between 15 and 30 and 11% of teenage boys with type 1 diabetes, is still relatively unknown. The condition which involves a person with type 1 diabetes omitting insulin to lose weight has only recently gathered media attention. And as such, we are only just beginning to see the term diabolemia used in everyday language. Not officially recognised medically, diabolemia poses a very serious and real threat to its victims and as such has now been coined as the world's most dangerous eating disorder. As an eating disorder combined with a chronic illness, the complexities of explaining diabolemia often extend beyond that of more commonly known eating disorders, anorexia nervosa and bulimia. The reason why today I will give full and due attention to explaining exactly what diabolemia is. In understanding what the condition is and sharing this knowledge with people around us, we can go some way in spreading awareness of the condition. So what is diabolemia? Diabolemia is a condition that can affect people with type 1 diabetes, a lifetime autoimmune condition thought to affect around 30,000 people in Scotland. When you have type 1 diabetes, cells in your pancreas are attacking, attacked, making it unable to produce insulin, a vital hormone which takes the glucose from our food into our bloodstream and delivers it to all the different cells of our bodies. Without insulin, our body cannot get the nutrients it needs, which is why people are first diagnosed with diabetes. They usually have lost a lot of weight and often feel irritable and low. Upon diagnosis, sufferers will begin to inject doses of insulin calculated to match what they eat and, and significantly it is after taking insulin that sufferers will often regain the weight they lost when they were ill and this will usually stabilise at a weight which is slightly heavier than the healthy non-diabetic population. Importantly in understanding diabolemia, it is owing to this weight gain that people who need insulin are often faced with a terrible choice. They can lose weight without even having to diet by restricting their insulin or by stop taking it altogether. The signs, therefore, may not be obvious. With diabolemia, there is no need for food restriction, purging, exercise, or any of the classic symptoms often related to eating disorders, so the condition can go unnoticed. Sufferers will also show no signs of weight loss. They can retain normal eating habits and appear absolutely fine to the friends and family around them. On a recent BBC Three documentary concerning diabolemia, a young woman with the condition sat down with her parents and told them that there had been periods where she had not taken insulin for up to two weeks at a time, something they were oblivious to, understandably, despite living in the same house. The effects of this are huge. Without insulin, your body is unable to take the nu nutrition from food. Patients can suffer from permanent loss of eyesight, pains and loss of sensation in their feet and hands, kidney damage, and eventually they become blind, need dialysis or transplants, or suffer from amputations. The, da the damage is cumulative rather than reversible. Unlike ordinary starvation, which is mostly reversible over time, given enough nutrition, and this is why diabolemia has come to be known as the world's most dangerous eating disorder. Statistics have shown that while the 10-year mortality rate for people with diabetes is two per, sorry, two per thousand people, and for anorexia, it's seven per thousand people. Diabolemics face a much higher mortality rate of 35 per thousand people affected. Speaking in the same documentary, Becky Rudkin, a woman from Aberdeen, spoke of her 10-year battle with diabolemia, a condition which resulted in her suffering three diabetic comas and something she was eventually only saved from after being sectioned. Raising awareness of diabolemia is key to prevention. Work is being done. We are hearing about the condition more and more in the media 
and examples of good practice are taking place up and down the country. In Glasgow last year, Diabetes UK held a professional conference featuring a discussion on diabolemia, and for many of the 3,000 people in attendance, this will have been the first time they have ever heard of the condition. In the north of Scotland, where the specialist eating disorder Eden Unit exists in Aberdeen, diabetic clinicians and eating disorder clinicians are holding workshops together and establishing good permanent working links to support patients together, something we should work to build on. As ever, there is always more to be done. Good practice does exist, and among health professionals, clinicians are fairly familiar with the symptoms of the condition, and diagnosis does occur through the use of a specialist questionnaire and blood testing. But once diagnosed, there is no official diagnosis code for diabolemia within the NHS framework, and sufferers can be classified as having an eating disorder not otherwise specified, or an atypical eating disorder. As a result, there is no current NHS guidelines on how to deal with the issue, and patients are not always treated with the interdisciplinary approach that is needed. An issue that was raised specifically by a family I have, I have been in contact with who have been personally affected. The treatment needed for a diabetic with an eating disorder is quite different from that of a person without diabetes. And I would therefore like to use this opportunity to urge for integrated thinking across the country when it comes to covering the two elements of care. To finish today, I once again would like to thank members who have spoken in this debate and showed their support for raising awareness of diabolemia. I have been very proud to bring this subject forward to the Chamber and I hope that this will have generated more interest in a subject that deserves greater degree of publicity. We require to tackle this issue head on and that is why I'm pleased that sufferers of the condition are feeling more comfortable in coming forward to share their often very harrowing stories. While diabetes is a condition that most, if not everyone, is acutely aware of, diabolemia is a condition that may well exist within people's families, but relatives are completely unaware of the suffering that their loved ones are going through. By having this condition officially medically recognised, I believe this would be a major step forward in helping raise awareness of the disorder, as well as help to gain better support for those living with diabolemia. This has been an important debate and I hope this is a subject we can raise again in the Chamber. I move the motion in my name. Uh, thank you. Uh, no need to move a motion, but that doesn't matter. I'm calling Emma Harper and I would like to call Mr Whittle, but he's not pre... There you go. <laughs> uh, Ms Harper, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I would like to congratulate Annie Wells for securing this important debate. As someone who has type 1 diabetes and a registered nurse, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak in this debate today. It is important to emphasise that this debate is about raising awareness of a condition which hasn't been officially recognised. And as co-convener of the Cross-Party Group for Diabetes with Dave Stewart, I appreciate that raising awareness of this eating disorder is crucial. It is estimated that across Scotland there are almost 35,000 uh, persons living with type 1 and diabulimia is sometimes referred to as EDDMT1, eating disorder diabetes mellitus type 1. It is difficult to diagnose and diabulimia is an extremely complex condition where over a period of time a person with type 1 either stops or restricts the amount of insulin they inject in an attempt to control their weight. Why do people do it? Well, there's listings on the Diabetes UK website that talks about obsession with food labels, negative attention to weight, hypo-binging, constant awareness of numbers, parent attitude towards type 1, shame over management, negative relationships with healthcare providers, and difficulty losing weight due to insulin. Insulin, as Annie Wells mentioned, is the protein that acts as a bridge to allow energy supply and glucose into the blood to transfer into cells to support metabolism. So when someone omits their insulin, it causes the blood sugar levels to, to really get high and results in metabolism of fat and then protein in the muscle as the body needs it as an energy, uh, an energy source. So this is what leads to the weight loss. As the physical health needs of those suffering from diabolemia also require mental health support, it can cause a range of emotions, feelings of depression, shame, guilt, low self-esteem, and having to closely monitor the diet and everyday stress of life. 
I spoke with one of the nurse specialists this morning um, from NHS Dumfries and Galloway from the diabetes team and uh, I wanted to find out about what NHS Dumfries and Galloway have for people who are suspected of having this eating disorder and I was informed that NHS Dumfries and Galloway now have a new dietitian who specialises in weight management and eating disorders and his remit will include referrals, assessing and supporting type 1s with diabulimia. So this is actually good news for folks in the southwest of Scotland. Um, again, for health professionals, we ask for them to look out for um, type 1s who focus on weight control rather than blood glucose control, because that is one of the first um, signs that a focus on uh, weight is actually the most important thing rather than blood glucose control. So the research suggests that women in particular are at higher risk for developing diabulimia. And I was surprised to find out that an estimated 60% of women with type 1 diabetes will have experienced a clinically diagnosable eating disorder by the age of 25. Presiding officer, that is a profound statistic. The same research also suggests that men with type 1 have a much higher drive to lose weight than their non-diabetic counterparts also. So when I was researching ahead of this debate today, I found that uh, the, the documentary Diabulimia and Me was quite interesting for anybody to Google and look at to help raise awareness of this condition. And the one lady in the documentary, her name is Becky Rudkin, she stated, you don't get a day off from diabetes. There's a lot of numbers dictating your life, from calorie counting to watching the scales. I can identify with focusing on those, those numbers. There's carb numbers, there's blood glucose numbers, there's insulin unit numbers, and don't get me started on ketones. So Becky's correct, there's a lot of numbers dictating how one should manage one's own autoimmune disease to prevent complications and stay well. So my message as I'm closing is, congratulations to Annie Wells for a comprehensive overview of the causes of and the condition and the effects of diabulimia. Great job, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle to be followed by Colin Smith. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I am delighted to be able to speak in this debate and I congratulate my colleague Annie Wells for securing the time in this chamber to highlight and discuss this issue. And I also would like to thank Diabetes Scotland uh, for the briefing papers. And although I'm a member of the CPG group on diabetes and, and, and continually being educated by Emma Harper, uh, I have to say at, at the outset, this condition was not familiar to me until fairly recently. And of course, aware of other uh, eating disorders such as bulimia and anorexia, which I actually have got some experience of, and you may be surprised to hear from the world of sport, nearly always in women. Uh, in their drive for excellence in track and field, I do know of distance runners who have taken their dietary habits too far and crossed into the realm of eating disorders. I've also had to help a, a, a person close to me whom bulimia became a problem against someone who was immersed in sport whom you'd not necessarily imagine would fall into that unhealthy cycle. I only mention that because uh, 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 these, these conditions can very easily be hidden. And I think with diabulimia, th this is a condition that seems to have potentially even more dangerous outcomes because it's associated with a condition that not properly treated can in itself lead to life-threatening situations. Those suffering from type 1 diabetes have a constant need to control their blood sugar level by injecting insulin. If monitored properly, properly, those with type 1 diabetes can live a very normal life in just about every way. I have mentioned before in this chamber that uh, I'm lucky to coach an athlete with type 1 diabetes and he has gone on to medal at Scottish level in, in the 1500 metres. However, the idea of controlling weight loss by reducing their insulin intake is quite shocking, especially when it's suggested that although this condition can affect men, 60% of females, as has been mentioned uh, by Emma Harper, with type 1 uh, diabetes will have experienced a clinically diagnosed eating disorder by the age of 25, 60%. And like most eating disorders, the foundation for this con condition lies, I think, in a psychological uh, issue, an issue of how one sees oneself and how one would want to look. This is certainly an, an issue of self-deprecation, a lack of confidence that opens up a whole can of worms around public perception of what, what, what look is desirable and what is, is, not, is not predominantly driven by the media, but perhaps 
That is a debate for another day. In securing today's debate, this parliament is able to raise the issue, to shine a light on it, so to speak, that will hopefully go some way to bring it to the attention of the greater public. Perhaps more importantly, it may reach out to those who are suffering from this condition and let them know that there is help out there for them and they do not need to suffer alone. The Diabetes Improvement Plan indicated that deployment of psychologists has made a significant inroad into the issue in the areas of deployment. The further support and training made available to staff to increase the level of psychological assessment skills has to be highlighted and the rollout continued. Healthcare professionals, family and friends need to be aware of the telltale signs that could indicate di uh, diabolemia, and I won't go into them again, as they've already been mentioned. And I recognise that Diabetes Scotland are calling for the action to improve recognition and management of the condition, and hopefully this debate is part of that raising of the awareness. Once again, I, can I congratulate Annie Wells for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and for anyone with questions or needing advice to contact Diabetes Scotland on their helpline, because this is a condition that no one should have to live with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, call Colin Smith, we're followed by Claire Hockey, and Claire Hockey will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to echo the, the thanks of others to Annie Wells for our motion, which allowed this debate today, and given us MSPs the opportunity to play, a, I think, a small part in raising awareness of diabolemia, a condition that, as we've already heard, is both incredibly dangerous, but also poorly understood. Although I'm my, my party spokesperson on public health and a, and a member of the, the Parliament's Health and Sport Committee, I have to confess until recently my own understanding, uh, like many others, was limited. And I want to commend Diabetes UK and other charities for the work they are doing to try to tackle the lack of awareness of this condition. I also want to place on record thanks to the BBC for the, the recent BBC3 documentary, Diabolemia, the World's Most Dangerous Eating Disorder, which was mentioned by Annie Wells and e Emma Harper. That documentary brought home to me and I think others that the real life human impact of diabolemia for three young sufferers and their families. And I would say to other members, if you haven't watched the documentary, please do so on BBC iPlayer. The lack of awareness surrounding diabolemia makes identification and treatment more difficult and contributes to the stigma associated with this condition. Until we improve recognition and understanding, it will be hard to improve our early intervention and provide better treatment. Those with diabolemia are faced with the dual burden of both type 1 diabetes and an eating disorder. Now, there are serious physical and psychological symptoms associated with both, and the interrelation of the two makes it a particularly high-risk condition. The potential physical complications of diabetes, such as diabetic ketoacidosis, damage to eyesight, kidneys and nerve endings, are significantly heightened by taking less insulin than required, and the possibility of doing lasting damage is high. Likewise, that the hyper-awareness of food and diet necessitated by diabetes can entrench and perpetuate the unhealthy relationship with food that underpins eating disorders. In addition to the severe risks associated with diabolemia, its prevalence is also a, a cause for serious concern. As the motion notes, research has found that up to 40% of women aged 15 to 30 with type 1 diabetes have the condition. Whilst it's thought to be less common amongst men, men with type 1 diabetes have been found to exhibit a higher drive for thinness than their non-diabetic counterparts, putting them at risk of diabolemia. Uh, indeed, a recent study in Germany found that 11.2% of boys between 11 and 19 omit insulin to lose weight. However, as it's not a, rec a recognised medical condition, it's all but impossible to gather accurate information about its prevalence and the risks it poses. There are no reliable statistics for exactly how many people suffer from diabolemia and deaths caused as a result of it are recorded as being as a result of diabetes complications. This not only masks the scope of the problem but limits analysis of its impact and relevant trends. If we are to improve awareness, prevention and treatment of diabolemia, we need a better understanding of the issue. Recognising it as a specific medical condition is crucial to building a comprehensive view of who diabolemia affects and how. The complex nature of the condition can make it difficult to secure the right treatment. Too often, diabetes experts may lack an adequate understanding of eating disorders, and mental health professionals may not be familiar with the challenges of diabetes. It is a unique condition that requires specialist treatment and a multifaceted approach. NICE guidelines on diabetes do highlight the heightened risk of eating disorders those with diabetes face, and likewise, the guidance on eating disorders now has a subsection on diabetes for all categories of eating disorders. Crucially, this includes a specific treatment plan for those taking the appropriate dose of insulin. It's encouraging to see the clinical guidelines beginning to reflect the reality of this condition, and I welcome the progress being made on this matter. 
However, many patients still struggling to get suitable treatment, there is still a great deal more to do. The sign guidelines are yet to be brought in line with NICE on this matter, and there is still insufficient knowledge amongst healthcare professionals on how to identify and support people with diabulimia, so this needs to improve. To deliver informed, evidence-led treatment for diabulimia across Scotland, we must do more to facilitate collaboration between the two fields and develop expertise on the condition. By making this happen and raising awareness of this condition, we can play our part in ensuring that those with diabulimia get the treatment and support that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Smith. I call Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to refer members to my register of interests, in particular to the fact that I am a registered mental health nurse holding a current registration with the NMC and to my honorary contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS. And I too would like to add my thanks to Annie Wells for bringing this important issue to the Chamber for debate today. Most people will not have heard of diabulimia. It isn't an illness classified in either DSM-5 or ICD-10, both of which are the internationally recognised classifications of disease and health-related problems. So really, it isn't surprising that most healthcare professionals may not have heard of it either. In preparing for today's debate, I even found it difficult to find published research on diabulimia. I do note, however, that insulin omission should now be considered a clinical feature when diagnosing anorexia and bulimia. So I sincerely hope that we as MSPs are able to use our debate today to increase its recognition, not only amongst the healthcare and research communities, but also with the public. As we've already heard from other speakers, um, the word diabulimia merges the words diabetes and bulimia. Type 1 diabetes is treated by regular injections of insulin to control blood glucose levels. And diabulimia is the term which describes where someone regularly, deliberately reduces the amount of insulin they take to control their weight and alter their body shape. Presiding officer, diabulimia itself is certainly not a household name but it is a condition which could possibly affect a large proportion of our population. As we've already heard, there are around 30,000 people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in Scotland. And from the little research that there is into diabulimia, a significant percentage could be susceptible to being affected by it. Although Diabetes Scotland warned to treat these figures with caution, one study has found that estimates of insulin emission have been reported in up to 40% of people with diabetes. Other research from Germany suggests that over 10% of males between 11 and 19 omitted insulin to lose weight. Presiding officer, I'm sure we all agree that those figures are rather alarming and could just be the tip of the iceberg in terms of the numbers of people affected. So what happens when someone with type 1 diabetes omits their insulin? Blood glucose levels increase. Hyperglycemia leads to polyuria, essentially passing an increased amount of urine. And this means any calories are excreted and as a result are not used and the body is starved of energy. If hyperglycemia is untreated, it becomes life-threatening diabetic ketoacidosis. And if this is left untreated, it is fatal. The longer term effects of diabulimia are equally dangerous. Not taking enough insulin over a longer period of time can shorten life expectancy. Other complications linked to diabetes, such as retinopathy, neuropathy and nephropathy, can occur earlier in life and it also can lead to infertility. In cases where diabulimia leads to severe diabetic ketoacidosis and is not treated, heart and organ failure occurs. To anyone who is struggling with this illness, I would make an impassioned plea. Reach out, talk to someone you trust. There is help available. And with that help, you can get better. Presiding officer, before I end, I would like to pay tribute to my SNP colleague, Dennis Robertson, who served the Aberdeenshire West constituency with distinction between 2011 and 2016. Councillor Robertson is a true champion of raising the awareness of eating disorders. During his time in this parliament, he spoke on many occasions of his own family's experience of eating disorders, leading to the tragic death of his daughter. Despite Dennis no longer sitting in this parliament, I'm pleased to say that there are still members who will carry the torch to raise awareness of such devastating conditions. And I again thank Annie Wells for securing today's debate on diabulimia. And I hope that we as a parliament have been able to raise the awareness of this condition so many more people can come forward to get the help they need and to recover. Thank you very much, Ms Hawkey. And I call on Shona Robertson to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Up to seven minutes, please.
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, also join others in thanking Annie Wells for bringing what is a, an important debate to Parliament to, today? And I'm very pleased to be able to respond on behalf of the Scottish Government. Uh, we want to continue to drive improvements in mental health services and are absolutely committed to ensuring that everyone, including people with diabetes who need access to high quality mental health services, have access to that care when and where they need it. And in that respect, it's right that we recognise the efforts of all the people and organisations across Scotland involved in raising awareness and treating eating disorders. We also want the, the best for people living with diabetes and raising public awareness of using insulin to control weight is important. And I can assure members that the behaviours and risks involved are well known to clinicians, particularly those working in diabetes and mental health services. Uh, I do accept, however, that there is always scope for greater awareness and understanding among professionals and for the development of improved specialist support in response to, to this behaviour. And we're working with NHS Scotland and partners to do just that and to ensure that services are in place to meet the needs of people who are at risk and who use insulin to control weight. Type 1 diabetes is more than simply a physical condition and like anyone suffering a serious chronic condition, there is often a psychological impact. Anyone who needs support should, of course, get it. However, growing up with diabetes is challenging enough without the pressures and expectations of modern life. And that's why we need to support young people with diabetes in particular and think about their health and social well-being. Young people need good support to manage their condition through their life from child to adulthood. Diabulimia, as has already been said by many, is not a, a diagnostic term. It is, however, important that the behaviour of using insulin to control weight is recognised. Misusing insulin to reduce weight is clearly unhealthy and dangerous, and it's important that people are equipped to better manage their own health. The dangers of underusing insulin to lose weight in the long term can be severe. As others have mentioned, chronic poor diabetic control can lead to the loss of limbs, kidney damage, blindness, heart damage and other serious complications. I also recognise that determining the prevalence is difficult. It's hard to quantify the problem because people tend to hide it from family, friends, carers and clinicians. No matter how the behaviour of using insulin to control weight is officially recognised, what is important is that people demonstrating such concerning behaviour receive the care, help and support that they need when and where they need it. So our new mental health strategy aims to do just that. The guiding ambition of the strategy is, is very simple. We must prevent and treat mental health problems with the same commitment, passion and drive as we do for physical health problems. It also has a focus on improving the quality of care and ensuring equal access to the most effective and safest care and treatment. And this is important for people living with diabetes and those with eating disorders as for anyone else. Through the delivery of the strategy, we seek to improve access to psychological therapies and to treatments for children and young people. We're supporting the development of a digital tool to support young people with eating disorders. We also want to highlight the important role of liaison psychiatry in providing a, a specialist mental health service across a wide range of acute services and physical illnesses. We look to NHS Scotland and partners to improve liaison psychiatry services and mental health provision for acute patients. In line with best practice, NHS services should have local mental health support for people with type 1 diabetes. The signed guidelines for the management of diabetes recognise how common mental disorders are and it gives information on mental health assessment and treatment. The third, third sector, primary care and specialist services all have an important role to play in providing support and advice to people who misuse insulin in order to lose weight. And there are good practice examples to highlight in respect of specialist services. For example, the NHS Lothian Diabetes Mental Health Service currently has a dedicated liaison psychiatrist and psychiatric nurse resource specifically for diabetes. And I know this service is highly valued by clinicians and patients and has demonstrated good clinical and financial outcomes. The service does see patients with an eating disorder and who use insulin to control weight. And these patients are seen as a priority by the eating disorder service at the Royal Edinburgh's Cullen Centre when referred on. 
Individuals who are referred to eating disorder services can expect to receive the highest quality of care and support from the NHS. A wide range of community hospital and specialist inpatient services are in place across Scotland to meet the needs of people living with an eating disorder. In 2009, I had the pleasure of formally opening the Eden Unit in Aberdeen a specialist NHS eating disorder inpatient unit serving the north of Scotland, and it continues to provide valuable care and specialist support. Um, I think uh, Emma Harper also mentioned uh, the, the work in NHS Dunfries and Galloway with the, the new uh, dietitian appointment, uh, which will uh, help to uh, uh, improve services for weight management and eating disorders in the south of Scotland, which is um, very important. And of course, Brian Whittle mentioned the Diabetes Scotland helpline and the involvement of Diabetes Scotland in this area is hugely important. But I also thought he made a, uh, an important point about the wider societal pressures that drives um, people of any age, but particularly young women, uh, to want to look a certain way. And that's an issue that is really hard uh, to, to tackle. Uh, I think Colin Smith referred to the BBC documentary, The Most Dangerous Eating Disorder, is absolutely well worth a watch. Uh, very, very powerful indeed. And of course, uh, Claire Hawkey uh, um, outlined uh, very well the, the, the consequences of omitting insulin and quite rightly paid tribute to um, former MSP councillor Dennis Robertson, who still champions the, the cause of eating uh, disorders. So let me close by uh, saying that, you know, we are very ambitious for continued improvement. I want to repeat my thanks to Annie Wells for raising an issue that I think many people knew little about, and that's one of the really uh, powerful things about members' business, the opportunity to raise that, and hopefully some of the media attention around this important issue will raise awareness, but importantly, hopefully encourage people who may have concerns and may have a problem in this area to seek help because see, uh, help is there and we want people to get the support that they need. Uh, so I hope I've been able uh, to give the, the Scottish Government support today for the work going on in this area uh, and uh, thank everybody for their contributions to this important debate. Thank you very much. I say to Annie Wells, in 18 years in here, I'd never heard of this before. So it was very important that you raise this at a member's debate. Uh, that concludes the debate and I suspend the meeting until 2.30.